Well, we're ready. Um, you guys want to share it on your pages just so that we can send it out? Um, the link? This link? Yeah. So if you go on the Claymore's Bet, um, you'll have, you'll see the um, the countdown. Ready. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are the board members of Claymore Vets. Uh, we have Lucy, Gina, we have Bernie, who's uh, having some technical things to work, so she'll be joining us. And Miriam wasn't feeling so good today, so she wanted to be here. But um, thank you so much. We wanted to kick off this Women's History Month by celebrating the, the achievements and the sisterhood. But um, I wanted to kick this off by introducing the community to these amazing women that I am so proud to call my friends, my mentors, my, my you know, battle buddies. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce Lucy, who is our vice chair. And this woman, um, you can introduce yourself because I, I'll, do, I'll do a better job. Whose doing dog it. is barking? It's not mine. <laughs> no, that's Venus. <laughs> Not my dog. Um, hi, I'm Lucy Delgadio. Um, I am a U.S. Army veteran, and I am the, like Maria said, the vice chair of Claymore Vets. Um, I served um, from 90 to 98 in the active and reservist capacity. Um, I am, uh, again, Desert Storm um, era veteran. Um, and uh, what else did you want me to talk about? Um, what my MOS was, I started my MOS. Um, I was a Morse code interceptor, 98 hotel. Um, and then from, uh, I became a 75, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. And yeah, then I, oh, right. uh, I was a Morse code interceptor. And then, then I moved and I became a 75 Bravo slash 71 Lima, an administrative assistant. Um, they used me in different capacities because, uh, again, I went to MI school and I had a multitude of different clearances. So my capacity as a 75 Bravo was very, like, all over the place. Um, and, um, yeah, and what led me to the military was uh, my father passing away and my mother not being able to afford two daughters in college. And I tried to seek assistance to go to school. Um, both my brothers were serving. Um, at the time, um, one in the Army, one in the Marines. So one Marine, one Army. Um, I went, <laughs> I'll be very honest with you, I went to the Army because it had a shorter boot camp. I, I didn't think I could survive 12 weeks because <laughs> uh, I was pretty uh, private Benjamesque. Um, and um, so Army, I went. Plus, my brother was actually a recruiter in the Bronx at the time. So my brother was my recruiter. And I left uh, my PC. I left out of uh, Fort Hamilton. Um, and um, yeah, so that was my adventure into the military. Um, currently, um, I, um, you know, I, I'm a mom of four and I work for Prudential Financial, but I also do a lot of advocacy work, advocacy space, especially here in New Jersey for, you know, to try to fight the disparities that women um, veterans are facing and homelessness and housing and VA um, issues, but also on um, the nation national front um, when it comes to sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, Gina and I have the privilege of sitting on the Commission of Women Veterans for the state of New Jersey, and I have the privilege of being appointed by um, the Secretary of the VA, Dennis McDonough, to the new work, for, um, work group for sexual harassment and sexual assault. So uh, not that I, I do have multiple um, <laughs> clones that do a lot of this work <laughs> because it's like, uh, um, how could I do all this stuff? Um, but I do that. And um, I also, you know, run and uh, 
I, I started teaching yoga. Um, I became certified, so I teach yoga on Friday nights and on Tuesday nights to the Pink Berets. And um, I'm a member of this as a board member and a board member for Community Hope here in New Jersey. But I also do volunteer work for Minority Veterans of America, Lindsay Church's great organization, and the Pink Berets out of Texas, Stephanie Gattas, wonderful. Um, organization. So it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, and Gina, take it away. Before she goes, so this is why I told her to introduce herself, because I'm like, wait, I know I'm going to forget somebody, I'm going to forget something. So you better do it yourself. So all around badass. And I love you. And thank you for, for being here. All right, yeah. Gina, you take it away. I'm going to try to help Bernie with this situation. So Go. <laughs> okay. So, um, first of all, thank you, Maria, for putting this together um, for Women History Month. Um, Clean more vets, um, uh, along with my uh, cohorts, Lucy Del Gladio, Maria Salazar, uh, Miriam, um, and the other board members. Um, you know, obviously, this is uh, something that's really important uh, to us to bring focus to our women. Um, veterans, but women in general. Um, my story is, uh, I'm a Marine, by the way, in case anyone doesn't know, um, pretty vocal about that, hoorah. Um, and I, I usually wear it on my sleeve, on my head, everywhere. Um, I, and uh, I'm very proud of the fact. Um, I served in 1988 and went to boot camp in uh, October of 1988. Uh, there, I was the first uh, woman in my family to serve in the military, uh, but I wasn't uh, the only, you know, the first person. I had a lot of male relatives. My grandfather, both my grandfathers, my great grandfather um, was part of the first uh, uh, Puerto Rican um, battalion in the army to serve. Um, and uh, you know, it, it kind of it runs in the family on my both sides, but uh, I was the first woman that uh, stepped up. And at the time, I'd always I always had a call to serve. Um, but at the time, it just happened to be right when I was around 18 years old. And I decided on the Marines for well two reasons. One, I figured if I was going to go into the military, I wanted to try what I considered and heard and understood as to be the hardest. And two, let's face it, the uniforms are just awesome. So uh, those were the two main reasons why uh, I chose the Marines. And um, and yeah, it was actually 13 weeks when I went, so I, I get that. Um, so I my uh, my service was cut short. Um, I was uh, um, early early discharged due to homosexuality um, back before. Don't ask, don't tell. Um, and I didn't consider myself a veteran for about 30, 30 something years. And, um, when I learned that that was not actually the case, I did have a general under honorable discharge. Uh, I had no other misconduct or anything like that. And, um, when I found out that I was still considered a veteran, it, something inside me just clicked and I grabbed onto it and I jumped in with both feet. And in my eyes, continued my service that was cut short by jumping into the veteran space and assisting my fellow veterans, whether it be um, male, female, it didn't really matter. I joined my American Legion. I joined the Marine Corps League. I joined the Women Marines Association. Um, I'm a lifetime member of the DAV, a lifetime member of the Marine Corps League. I serve as a veteran service officer for uh, American Legion, post 310 in Little Ferry, serve as a veteran service officer and junior vice commandant for my Marine Corps League detachment in Teaneck. I'm the co-chair of the SOS Vet, New Jersey SOS Vet Stakeholders Group uh, Women's Subcommittee, along with um, Lucy. Um, I'm on the board also for a, a, a wonderful um, organization called Backpacks for Life. Uh, we deal a lot with referrals for um, homeless veterans. Uh, I work in the veteran space uh, for Catholic charities, uh, supportive services for veteran families, 
uh, for which is a VA funded grant for um, assistance with homeless veterans and at risk of homeless veterans. And I was an outreach worker for them. And it was one of the most fulfilling uh, career paths and job opportunities that I ever, ever had. I was fortunate to work for someone that I considered a mentor and a friend. His name is David Pearson. And he was one of the most veteran centric civilians I have ever met. And I'm proud to call him a friend. And he had given me the opportunity to learn about myself and to seek help for myself and to get the benefits that I deserve as a veteran and deal with the VA. I am a service connected veteran. I also, uh, excuse me, um, I also just recently in November was granted my discharge upgrade to a full honorable. And I'm very, very, very proud of that. I do a, a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say work with, but I, I can't give enough accolades to Modern Military Association of America which is an LGBTQ um, organization for military veterans that fight on the legislative end in DC. Um, and they were the ones that assisted me with the uh, legal uh, been legal assistance to get that, that upgrade squared away. It took 33 years to get it done. So it's something that it shouldn't be that difficult. It shouldn't be, uh, the necessity shouldn't be there where you only have three years uh, statute of limitations from the time you know. Um, so that's my experience. Uh, there's there's intricacies. If anyone has any questions, you're welcome to uh, email me. Well, I guess we'll have our email addresses out there. I'd love to talk to anybody who has anything to do with it. I got involved with uh, Claymore Vets through my association with um, Maria. We don't, we can't seem to narrow down exactly how we got to meet. Uh, we know the first face-to-face -face was through the WMA, which is Women Marines Association, and uh, through the Marine Corps League. But somehow we were connected, at least on Facebook, before that. And I learned of what uh, Maria was doing with Claymore Vets and really, really enjoyed the prospect of healing through art as a medium and appreciated the fact that anything that helps a veteran, I'm behind. I might not, have, like the yoga, I, I, I cannot even, like I can't put my jacket on, I have no flexibility. But if it supports, if I could support it and so it helps somebody else, I'm all for it. And I'm one of these people that I can make music, but I can't draw a straight line with, with a ruler. I'm not an artistic person that way. But if so, it helps somebody and I can bring someone to the table where it can help, help them. I'm all about um, assisting with that. And I, I have different hats in different, in different spaces, but in the veteran space, I, if I don't know the answer, I know somebody who knows the answer. And uh, my reach is that way. And I, I do well at connecting others to each other. And so that's why I'm happy to be the outreach uh, director on the board for Claymore Events. AKA the Godfather. Yes. <laughs> I know a guy who knows a guy. I got you. Don't worry. Exactly. I got a guy. I got a guy. I know a guy. I got, I got a guy. The wolf. The wolf. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, before I forget, before, yeah, before I forget, I, I just want to tell you how much it touched me to be able to hear your story. Uh, uh, you know, because it's a lot. It means a lot to be able to have that honorable discharge on, you, on your DD-214, you know? And yeah. When I tell you when it hit me the first time it hit me, I was at a training for VSOs um, at Seagirt and I had a speaker. I think it was a Navy um, veteran. I, I forget his name right now. I suck at names. I'm so sorry. My brain is mush. But he literally said at the end of his you know, speech, he was like, um, you know, the Navy gave me medals for killing 100 men and they gave me a dishonorable discharge for loving one. Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, Man, it's you know, and, so. and Maria, you know what what's make what makes it so inc what you do and what our organization does is that it, it's not it, we don't care about what the paper says. Right. We we know you served, and like Gina, you know, I just recently got my service connection after twenty nine years. Um, I'm it was it's very validating 
to get that connection after years of fighting. Um, and this is what, you know, art does, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I met you at, at Team RWB and we were at Runners One in Central Park on a cold day. Um, that was the first time I met you and we interacted, but when I really got to know you was at the Ronald McDonald house and we were all in the kitchen, all wearing our eagles. And um, I was making a con pollo and you walked in with a box of uh, red lobster biscuits. <laughs> I'll never forget that. And I was like, oh my God, here I am. All this pot's going. My, my, my tostones are here. My chicken and rice is here. And here she comes and she goes, okay, I'm going to make biscuits. And I'm like, I like her. <laughs> She's going to make biscuits. Yeah. But, but what I saw was I, I saw like myself. We grew because um, we weren't the same people we are sitting here right now when we were there back there. You know, I was when you met me, I was 289 pounds of of, you know, of meds um, and of self-destruction. And you've watched me change into the person, the med free for five years person. And, you know, a lot of your work has helped me do this because of the arts, because of the writing, because of the journaling, because of things that, you know, Claymore Vets puts in place. And that's what, again, like Gina said, anything that's going to help a veteran, I'm going to go for and I'm going to try to stand for and, and do my work and put my boots on the ground. But it's more rewarding also when it's something that I, I'm, I'm really, I, I've been through it and I could say, this organization helped me. And when you, you know, when you came to me and said, you know, could you be my chair? Of course, I'm going to be your chair because I've seen, <laughs> I've seen what you've done. I see your work, but I've seen, you know, when we walked into Columbia, Gina and I with Leah um, to see the first exhibit, it, we, you sold us. We saw what Claymore Vets could actually do. We, we felt that synergy in the room. We felt how veterans showing their artwork, what that connection felt like. And again, art is so powerful. Art is such an incredible medium and it could be, you know, digital, it could be photography, it could be painting, it could be writing, it could be any type of art, it could be music, but that art is healing, you know, and there's a healing aspect of it, but there's also that thought provoking aspect of it. It makes you think, it makes you think outside the box. And sometimes when you're alone and you're struggling and you know that you could take to a pen, you could take to a brush, you could take to a guitar and you could take yourself to a different place that you potentially don't have anybody else to go to. That's what this does. And um, again, that's why I'm so proud of being part of this board and part of this organization and, and the women that are surrounded around me because Again, this group of women just brings fire and inspiration to myself, but it also brings it to others. And I've witnessed it. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love that you said that, because when I was thinking of like, who do I want to be like, you know, my stakeholders for this, like obviously people that really get art, but like how you said it, right? Like art as in a vehicle to process, because for many of us, um, we've been trained not to talk. Right. We don't talk about stuff and we can't process it. And it just becomes this like thing on your chest that it won't let you breathe, you know. And um, and I think for me, it was it was important to have people that not only understand and, and you know, and like art, but actually have gone through it themselves, because I don't think you truly understand the power of art unless you embody it and you do it daily, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and that's why I feel like, I think, you know, I know I like I get cheesy, but I'm like, I get so like thankful and lucky that I have this team because you guys are amazing. I mean, like Bernie, she's a freaking, I love you. Okay, I'm gonna let her introduce herself because this is another one that has like a laundry list of everything she's done. She's like a freaking, you do, you do you, my girl. and they'll be uh they'll fall in love with you just like i did <laughs> thanks maria um everybody can hear me okay a little low but yeah nobody ever said that to me i know right <laughs> italians don't do low. <laughs> italians don't do low so i'm bernie donato and i am the resident baby boomer 
Um, I actually joined the Navy in 19, December of 1974 when the Vietnam War was just coming to an end. So I joined the, why did I join the Navy? I'm a nurse and I joined the Navy Nurse Corps because one thing you have to think of is back in my day, women did four things. They were nurses, they were teachers, they were secretaries, or they got married and had kids. Um, so I was a nurse. I'd been out of school a year. I moved to Florida because my brothers were there. I hated everything about Florida. Everything. Muggy, buggy, ugly. Everything about Florida. I hated it. So and no offense to anybody who likes it. But, but uh, I was sitting on the night shift of the small hospital thinking there's got to be more to life. So I got in my car because we didn't have internet back then. I got in my car. I looked for a recruiter. And I found a Navy recruiter first. So my father and all my uncles served in World War II. Um, and most all of them were in the Navy, a couple of them were in the Army. And um, so I signed up. I drove back to New York. I grew up in the farm country of New York State. And I spent um, just about six years on active duty Navy. I got restless again because I'm that girl. I got a little restless and say, you know what? There's got to be more to life than this. Because back then in the Navy, we really didn't have, unless you can get a gig on the repos of the sanctuary on the ships, then you were just in the hospital. So I got out of active duty Navy into inactive reserve. I had six months left in my contract. When the six months passed by, I said, I have no idea who to call to get out. So I just stayed inactive for a couple of years. And I took and started taking an airplane mechanic class because I thought that might be kind of fun to learn to be work on airplane engines. And during the class, I met someone in the Air National Guard who is an engineer on C-130s and says, hey, we have flight nurses. Oh, I don't really want to be a nurse. So I went up to the Air National Guard and said, I'd like to join join the Air National Guard as a mechanic because I had I had a finished class by then. I actually passed my FAA exam. And do you have any previous service? Yeah, I was a nurse. You were an officer. You can't join as enlisted. Why not? Well, we have flight nurses. So I thought about that. And lo and behold, I went back. I talked to the flight nurse recruiter who was just the best guy ever. And I spent the next 14 years in the Air National Guard as a C-130 tactical aeromedical evacuation squadron. And we're the 146 tactical airlift wing, but they called us the Hollywood Guard because our unit, that's what they call us. And I, I actually have the stuff. We have a name tag that says that we can't legally wear it, of course. Um, I served in Desert Shield and Desert Storm in the AOR in Saudi Arabia, 30 miles south of the Iraqi border, one of the three places I went. Um, always sat there and wondered why, you know, women weren't in combat then when those scud rockets were flying over my head. I was always wondering, really, who made those rules? Um, so I got out, I retired in 1999, which was like a thousand years ago. I've been retired over 20 years. It's hard to believe. Um, and then as a civilian nurse, civilian nurse, I worked, I was an emergency room nurse in South Central Los Angeles in the height of the gang wars. And I worked at the hospital. Remember the LA riots? Remember that truck driver? That's where I worked. I was the night charge nurse that night. He came in. Um, so that was my second war. That was like a, almost a year, exactly a year after Desert Storm. And it was, it was a pretty traumatic night for all of us there. Um, and then I also worked in Watts, in Martin Luther King and Watts. I retired from my civilian job in 2013 and moved, this New York girl moved to North Carolina. Out of a whim, I picked it out. People say, hey, why did you move to North Carolina? I have no idea. I heard it was a great place to live. Nine years later, I confirmed that. It's a great place to live down here. So art-wise, I've always been kind of artsy. You know, the only class I ever took was in high school. When I retired here to North Carolina, I found out we have Durham Arts Council, which is an amazing, amazing place. And I started taking classes there. I started taking classes at Duke and Ollie and come to find out I'm kind of a natural at it. I started with watercolor. I went to acrylics. I tried to take, I did take a abstract class and funny, my mind and Maria knows she sees my art, my mind, I see, I don't see abstract. My mind doesn't see, though I'm working more on it. In my mind, I'm a photorealist painter, though I have some stuff that isn't photorealist. So it's kind of my, my art journey has just boomed since I started nine years ago. Um, if you look at my work from nine years ago and today, it's just exponentially better, not necessarily in my opinion, but other people's opinions. Um, I went to finally got a, a therapist in the VA 27 years later, 
and I walked into her. I made the appointment. Luckily, we clicked. I mean, she was amazing. She does just women veterans. Um, and she said, what brings you here today? And I said, I see dead people. You got to remember, I was a nurse for 40 years. Like I said, I see dead people. I see a slideshow of dead people. I see a slideshow of sick, injured, wounded, beat, dead people. She said, you have PTSD, but I think you might know that. And then I started my journey. I started my journey with the therapist. The, I think the only thing that saved me, saved me in between. I mean, I was having meltdowns. I mean, we all, I think we all kind of understand that. I was having meltdowns all the time. I was depressed and then I was manic. I was running around. Is I'm the girl who does everything. I mean, I was a reserve police officer for the Los Angeles Police Department, went through the whole police academy in between my two deployments to Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Right in between there, I was finishing finishing up there. Um, I volunteered everywhere for everything. And basically what I was doing is running away from everything. Mm -hmm. So what's the idea? Yeah, if you run and if you don't have any time and you're so tired and then you try to sleep and my mind, you know, switches right on and then you don't sleep either. So art has really, really, really helped me a lot. It's really, I think it's it put a stay on a lot of those symptoms, but after a while, it just got to be too much. I equate it to, to um, box on the shelf, you know, every little trauma that you have, mine's not just wartime trauma. I have multiple incident trauma. Every trauma you have, you put it in a little box, you close that top and you put that box on the shelf, right? Well, the next thing you know, you have a whole bookcase full of boxes. And mm -hmm. as you get older, my therapist relays, as you get older and you're less active, though that isn't really me, but as you're elected, less active, those boxes start opening and your coping mechanisms, you're out of them, your coping mechanism. So, but art has really saved me. I'm in a frenzy today. I have, I have boxes of paint all over my floor and I'm in a frenzy painting something today. Um, the other thing is help is sports. Um, I'm certainly, I am going to be 70 years old in a couple months. Um, so I don't run anymore. I, I never like running to begin with, but, but, um, I do ride my bike a lot. I walk every day and a spine doc told me a couple of weeks ago that I have more muscle than anybody's ever seen in my age group. So, so I believe sports, that. Yeah. <laughs> the way you work out. <laughs> yeah. It is big arms. So sports has really helped also. And I've also got a service dog now who's, who's right here at my feet. So, um, I would tell people art is a, is a game changer. It's a game changer. It's my way of, of my hashtag is always tune out online and create, create. So how did I meet Maria? It turns out that our group, the Veterans Artists um, Community on Facebook, um, they put a lot of opportunities up and there was one that anybody want to go to New York? And, and was it the Intrepid, Maria? Is that the name? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to do a little art thing at the Intrepid. You got to pay your own way. Oh, yeah, I'll sign up. And that was the really beginning. And that's where I met Maria. I met some really great people there. When we all went to see the 9-11 uh, Memorial, I had never seen it. We, we partnered up and Maria was my partner. And it was just mind numbing, as we know. So um, that's when we kind of bonded. And that's when we met. And even though I was really honored when she asked me to be on the board. Um, I mean, I'm a whole generation away and I'm a lot of states, states away. And to me, this is a great honor to get to know all of you, even though I haven't seen you personally. I feel like I'm, no, I'm getting to know you. Oh, no. Listen, the honors online mine because... You're like my goals. You're so motivating. Um, you've done so much in your life. And it's so funny because you're a tiny little thing, but you're such a badass. Like, <laughs> you talk about you jumping out of the planes. You missed that part out. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when I was stationed in Okinawa in the Navy, so my sponsor was an Army nurse there because we switched commands over from the Army hospital to a Navy hospital. So my sponsor, Kathy Holper, will never forget her. They had a little skydiving club on Okinawa. I said, well, well that looks like fun. So I joined up in course, who, who taught us? Who do you think the jump master was? A Marine Corps gunny. And he was, a, yeah, he was a hard ass by Frank. Bobby, cool, dude. cool dude. So I'm jumping, but Kathy had already, already, um, um, transferred out. And so I'm the only woman there in, in the Marine Corps club. And we're jumping on the Island of Okinawa. If anybody knows anything about it, Yomachan Peninsula is about two miles long, two miles. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And all you see is ocean when you're up there. And they put me under a 35 foot T10 at the time I'm five foot two and 115 pounds. Right. So I floated all over. We, and we jumped the, the Marine Corps Sarbirds. 
and um, while there's while they're not doing anything, we might as well you know throw a bunch of people out of the helicopter, right? So that helicopter, you know, came to get me in a lot of places. And on my third jump, I don't. All I remember is almost landing, and my head hit the ground. And the next thing I remember, I was <laughs> I was in the Huey being medevaced to the hospital. So I guess, and I just have to tell the story because it's funny. And it's part of it, it's not funny because as women, we know, you know, when they talk about sexual harassment in the military in my generation, it's just, you know, women didn't speak up back then. It was just something that we just had to grit our teeth and bear. But, but when I got to the hospital, they admitted me I had a really bad concussion. I was unconscious for about 20 minutes. And later when those skydiving friends came to visit, they were telling me the story of what happened. I hit my head, I started getting dragged Luckily, I had a motorcycle helmet on. I started getting dragged. I got dragged across two fields and nobody came to get me. And I hit a bicycle and poor little Japanese man, I hit his bicycle and me and the bicycle kept on going. Finally, they came and got me. And when I finally asked, why didn't anybody come help me? You know what the answer was? Because you were a woman and we didn't want to favor you. So... Uh, yeah, that my, I told that to my therapist and I thought that her eyes got about this big. And I said, did it ever occur to you that if I didn't get up, that maybe I couldn't? Yeah, we thought about that later. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so that was, I mean, one of the biggest things of sexual harassment in the Navy. And then when I joined the Air National Guard, you know, pilots and nurses, I mean, the pilots, I'm sorry, they're the worst. They're the worst ever, the comments that ever came. I mean, the stuff women have to put up with. You have to remember when I came in in 1975, women weren't even allowed, weren't even allowed in in West Point. They weren't allowed in any of the service academies until 1976. So, you know, and it's crazy because you you think about it, you're like, oh, that's the past. Like, oh, that was so long ago. It really wasn't. It wasn't it so really long ago. Wasn't that long ago. But, exactly. but, but realize that we're still facing so right. many disparities still. Absolutely. Nothing has changed for us. We're still fighting the fight. You right. know, what happened was, and like in Bernie's time, nobody was talking about it. It was kept really under, you know, when I got assaulted was the first time that testimony for tailhook was going on. So the same year that I got assaulted in 92 was the testimonies for tailhook. And, and now we're here to 2022 and we're still fighting. And even though, you know, that EO it was signed um, by president Biden, now we have to do, okay, so you signed it. So how are you going to execute? So we have to keep on top of the execution of the actual accountability, but th there's so much disparity and there's so much still that we have to fight. And you would think, again, culturally, you would think it would shift somehow, but it, it, it hasn't. You know, I, I could tell you a multitude of stories about, you know, how my harassment started with the person that assaulted me. And it, it, it's mind boggling because it's my story, but people are going to say, you know what? I, I have no people that it happened to. This has happened to equates, you know, it, it to my acquaintance, it happened to someone in my unit. And mm -hmm. You know, it's not just the accountability of what's going on, you know, the acceptance of this, you know, this toxic culture that the military has accepted, but also just the, the fact is that there's so many other things that, that get neglected when it comes to women, when it comes to just sexual harassment, because, you know, sexual harassment, sexual assault doesn't discriminate in the military. And everybody knows right. that it happens to everybody. We recently saw the reports about the military service academies and, we, you know, the numbers of how many harassment and, and assaults take place there. So how are we going to feel safe in sending you know, our young men and women to those infrastructures when they are not taking care of us as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I did an interview yesterday with a reporter and, um, you know, it was a two hour interview and a, maybe about an hour and a half, I just cried because, you know, it opens wounds, you know, the, it's, it's a continuum of harm that we are facing, it, it's tragic that this continuum of harm, it starts at DOD, it follows us to VA because, you know, some VAs aren't safe either. We still get cat called, we still get questioned about our service. We're still looked at as like, you know, at times a piece of meat when we walk into the VA. Yeah. So these are things that, again, in, in this space, 
that was created by Claymore Vets, you could, it's, it's a safe space because when you're a creative and you're creating, that's your world and you're safe in it. Right. And, and we have to embrace it. We have to tell people, look, this is part of your toolkit. You know, I, 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 I developed a toolkit. I do things that help me so I don't have to pop my eight to 10 pills that I used to pop, you know. Right. So I, you know, I start my day with my yoga, my meditation, my journaling, you know, go out for my run, get myself going, you know, my, my journaling is my art, I, I journal. And that is the way that I contribute to this, this community by journaling and sharing it with others, sharing my experience and sharing my thoughts, but it helps me. And, and then we get this, these platforms like what we're doing right now when we get to share our stories and others could listen because that's when we make those relations. Like, you know, how relational Bernie's story is to my story, to Gina's story. And it, it's all like, you know, that sixth degree of, of Kevin Bacon in a way of, of how, you know, our traumas relate to each other and that relation helps us heal. Um, and this is what's, again, so important about Claymore is that, you know, you grab that piece of clay and you could heal. You grab that paintbrush, you could heal. You grab that pen, you could heal. And you could heal others with your words, with your arts, with your painting. You know, Miriam's not on the call tonight, but, you know, she was sharing this beautiful piece of art that she's working on, this beautiful phoenix rising with me in the last few days. And it just made us so... Uh, it, it made me so proud to be part of this community because, you know, her her work is just so empowering. So I'm Betsy, um, our beloved Betsy Montanez, mm -hmm. is asking for oh. Maria to share <laughs> your story because, again, everybody's heard our stories. And Maria, uh, you're the founder uh, of Claymore Rats. So tell us what's your story. I, listen, but I, I want people to, you know, get to know you guys and why I like, you know, I like a fangirl all, all, all over y'all, but um, so before so, I forget. Just, just real quick, uh, just jumping off something that Lucy was saying. So the true that, um, you know, the, the, the traumas uh, that, you know, can be worked through through the art medium is true. But at the same time, I feel like, uh, you know, the trauma doesn't define us. And I feel like that the art is defined and it brings out the trauma. So it's like the trauma is infused into the art and it's a release in a way. And that's where like the explosion toward the en enemy is. It's like, the, you know, art towards the enemy because the, the trauma goes into the art. It, it's an it's a, it's a outlet for that trauma. So it doesn't have to define us, but, and we all do share different traumas. Um, and some are similar, some are different, you know, but at the same time, it's not, it doesn't have to define us anymore. When we, when we choose something to, as an outlet, whether it's music or poetry or a uh, painting or photography or whatever. Um, and I think that's the important takeaway uh, from Claymore Vets is that, I, Maria, you, you had spoken, I don't know if it was in, uh, with David, um, uh, through Clubhouse or something, when you were talking about, I think it was a Vietnam uh, era veteran who was getting upset and angry, like he couldn't make the clay do whatever it was supposed to be a bowl or a plate or something. I don't oh, know. he was actually an Afghanistan veteran. Oh, yeah. oh was he in Afghan? Oh, I thought it was yeah. okay. So, and then he, you know, he like got up and he left and he smoked a cigarette or something like that. And he came back and, and he made it. And he's like, I made this. He, and, and he was like proud of the fact that he made that. And he's like, wow. He didn't even know that that beauty was in him. The ability was in him. And he yeah. learned that. Yeah. I, you know, gonna, I'd like to add to that too. So before COVID, um, I was asked by recreational therapy at the Durham VA if I would help lead um, art classes. And it was just up to me what we wanted to do. Um, and it was part of the recreation. The doctor had to order it for the veterans. And I'll tell you exactly what you just said. So some of the we had men and women, um, sometimes more women than men, but they would say, well, I'm not really artsy, but the looks on their face at the end, if, if we did a little painting, the day we did acrylic pouring, we did acrylic pouring twice, it was like crack for artists. I mean, they all went nuts. And, and the looks on their face at the end of the stuff, I have pictures, but the stuff they created and the smiles, and it's just, 
it's just so rewarding. I mean, so rewarding for them, rewarding for me to see that they're so happy that they created something, just like you said, with the gentleman with the bowl. Yeah. And, Maria, you know, hashtag that crack for artists because yeah, that was, yeah, I really hashtag for artists. Hashtag. I was like, I was like, whoa, that's a good one. Crack for artists. Our next t-shirt. Crack, crack, crack for artists. Crack for artists. Crack for artists. Crack for artists. Yeah. Like crack for artists. Yeah. Crack for artists. Yeah. Yeah. I'm such a realist. I don't even know what acrylic pouring is, but I'm oh down. Oh my god, you love it. You love it. Yeah, yeah. it. It's crack for artists. It's crack for artists. <laughs> crack for artists. Like, you don't have to. All you have to do is pick out some colors and you pour paint and you, and you make a mess but and you come out. With I can do that. I can definitely make a mess. I was gonna that's say so that's fun. a that's the crazy thing about it. And you know why it's such a it's crack for artists is because it's very intuitive and yes. you, it doesn't require you to hold like. Um, too much detail, like skillful detail, so you don't have to work with a brush or anything. You right. just want to have to think about like the process of making it, right? And then like uh -huh. adding colors and the hardest thing is what colors do you want to use? Exactly. <laughs> and then when you pour it out, it is very sensory. So like when it, it it falls out, it's it's almost like a lava lamp, but you're like painting a lava lamp. It's so cool. And then it's you definitely. just you just take your canvas and you move it and shape and watch all the shapes move. It's kind of mesmerizing. Yeah. And it has that, you know, it has that Monet type of quality from like far away. It looks really beautiful. And then you get up close and it's like a big old mess. And it's really just like, whoa, like, you know, the perspective, it gives you a perspective. It, it, it is, it is kind of crackish, you know, and it's like, like for me, it's like a Krispy Kreme. And it, and if you don't like it, it takes a few days to dry. And once it dries, if you don't like it, you just pour right over top of it. There you go. But uh, from, before we get carried, before we get carried away with crack, Maria, please share your, your oh, yeah. story with us of how you got involved. This is my crack. This is my crack. I'll, I'll stay in here. But so it's funny that it, it kind of ties into like what I wanted to say to Bernie before I forgot. Um, I I joined the Marine Corps because of 9 11. Um, you know, like I was, I was 21. I was already working as a paralegal. Um, and I, I'm very, I'm an empath. I really take on people's energies and, um, I got super depressed and I was like, this, the, like, and I think it triggered back my, my childhood from Peru, because that's the reason why we came from Peru because the terrorism in my country back in the nineties was really terrible. Um, and so when 9 11 happened, um, it really triggered something in me. Right. And I was like, this is my new home. How can it be happening here? But I was old enough to be able to protect it now, you know? And um, yeah, so like I, I got super depressed for like a whole week. I couldn't even get out of bed. I was like really sad. And then one Saturday morning, I see the police uh, running, you know, um, on, um, you know, with the recruiting uh, station or whatever. And um, and we're coming back from groceries. And I was like, I turned around. I told my mom, I was like, hey, uh, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. She's like, okay, crazy. You know, because I'm always coming up with these crazy ideas. I was like, all right. So this was Saturday morning. I um I got out of work on Monday, you know, and mind you, like I used to work as a paralegal and I used to go to court. Like I'm in like in a skirt suit, you know. I walk into the recruiting office and the guy, the recruiter was like, Don't you want the Air Force? I was like, Mother, I walked in here, right? I'm like, don't make me walk out. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. They wanted me to serve with the Air Force. And then, you know, I joined whatever. Um I sent, I, I, I went out and then the first letter I get from my sister, um, she's like, you know, I'm beginning to think you were serious about this joining the Marine Corps. <laughs> I'm like, you think I'm in boot camp reading your letter. Um, but it was crazy because I, I kind of hit the ground running. I checked into my unit in November. Um, this is an um, O2. I checked in November, went to the first ball. We got activated. Uh, the beginning of December, I'm in Camp Pendleton and like in the beginning of January and then like literally hit the ground running. So I deployed to Iraq in 03. Um, I was stationed with 6th Motor Transfer Battalion. Um, yeah, so it was it was basically the Wild Wild West, just like when you were there burning. It was, you know, on convoys and things. Um, but I think so art has always been a big part of me, I, you know, my life, my as a kid. I started painting when I was about maybe eight, nine, drawing, sketching, you know. Um, even when I was in Iraq, I had a sketchbook with me. And, you know, the seldom times where we were like on the side of the road or for like, you know, the quiet moments where I could just really like decompress, I was always sketching. Um, actually, when I, um, 
when I when I won that scholarship to go to um to Rome and Florence, I actually wrote about how even being at war, it was so beautiful to me to see the sunset because when it's coming down, like the, the way the sun hits the dunes, it looks like a golden ocean, you know? And then when the, the, the wind is blowing it, it's like, it almost feels peaceful, you know? And like that, that just position of like, you're a war. But at that very moment, looking at what nature and what God or the source of the universe is creating, and you feel so peaceful and you're like, it's, I don't know, it's, it's such a, a sorrow and Joey kind of thing, you know, like how can they both exist at the same moment? Um, but yeah, so like life art for me has been the one, the one thing I, I use to process life, you know, anytime I have, I don't talk about things too much. Um, and so I just pour it into painting and, and sculpting. Recently, I started doing poetry. Because I like like Lucy said, I've I've grown out of that comfort, you know. So um, I'm now empowered to use my words as where before my artwork was the veil, you know. I don't want to talk about it, but like here, look, you can look at this. That's all you're getting, you know. Um, but I think that there's a um, a very empowering feeling to be able to own your story, but then hear your own voice tell it, you know. And, um, and that's what I, I hope to do with Claymore Vets. Um, I want to, like Gina said, I, I think I want to be able to change the paradigm of how they see us as being reactive and explosive and that we're destructive, where in fact, in our core, we're not. We're creators, you know? The military is very good at zoning in and like pushing the buttons to make us be destructive. But they trained us. It took them 13 weeks to be like that. You know, there's no retraining us back to being reconnected to our families, to each other. There's no reconnecting us back to feeling our emotions, you know. And I think art is the one thing that helps you have an introspective journey and feel comfortable with yourself. Because I think that's where it starts first, you know, like identifying what you're feeling and processing those emotions. And when you when you sit in it and you feel really good then your whole your whole environment changes because the change really is from within out right um like you were saying that 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 veteran um gina he was um he, i i worked with the uh, samaritan village and they they work with like substance abuse and you know stuff like that and this guy he hadn't seen his family in years he had a little girl to three years older and um and he got really frustrated because he was on the wheel, right? The wheel is super hard. Like you have to really like balance because you can't push too much. You can't be a wuss and let it push you. Like you really have to find your balance, right? And he got super, super frustrated. And then he walked away. Um, I was so lucky that when I was in Long Island, I had amazing volunteers. And um, one of them, she she worked with special need kids. She was retired then, but she worked with special needs kids. So she knew how to handle a difficult, you know, uh, population. So she went out, she talked to him, whatever. She brought him back. She walked, she literally, you know, uh, worked one-on-one -on -one with him. And um, he ended up making a ball, right? And that that day he made three balls. They were a little wonky, but like he made them, right? So fast forward to like when we glaze them you know everything he picks it up the day i'm giving it to him like here it is like his bowl right it's made like you could the first thing he said he was like ah oh, man now i can i can watch um cartoons with my daughter on saturday morning and we can have cereal in there so he went from being so frustrated to feeling proud of something that he did and looking forward to reconnecting to his family and i think that's the power of art you know um and, you know, I'm a mush, so that made me cry. And then, you know, I'm going to cry now. But uh, <laughs> that's basically the story. Um, and I'm just so thankful that I have you all, um, that you guys believe in this mission and you believe in the art. And and the fact that we were able to get this set up during a pandemic, it was yeah. like, I love you all. <laughs> um, yeah, but that was about it. So if you guys want to say anything else, close in. But if anyone worry. has any space in the Somerville area, yeah. I can, yes, I can, <laughs> buildings. We're looking for an open building somewhere in the center area. Somerville on the, on the first floor that can handle a kiln. 
Yes. <laughs> we yeah. need or space. just has tables so we could start creating art in this space. If you want to loan us, you know, um, just something that we could be creative and we could have a place for our, our veterans to work um, on their their art, and that would be very lovely. But also, yeah. if you um, want to support Claymore Vets, we are a non for profit, a five hundred one c three, and you know. The, the, it could be a dollar, it could be $10, it could be whatever you feel would be your, your best bet. But, you know, it, it, it works um, for us. It works for our veterans. Uh, it buys supplies for veterans that don't have the, um, they're not equipped to buy the supplies themselves. Um, so please, you know, anything helps. And we and appreciate that. Rocio, I see your comment. You wish you were closer. One of our board members is in Puerto Rico. I mean, it, you know, we can we can uh, possibly set up some kind of a workshop online. It's, I obviously can't be clay, but uh, or well because of the kiln. But you know, we we're open uh, to doing some other things. It's just we have that is our one mindset. We want a space so that we can hold those workshops to help the veterans. But uh, don't don't use uh, distance as a deterrent for is for it, anything. And the way the way. Uh... My brain works. We'll have, we'll reach over everywhere. We're coming through North Carolina. We're going to go to Puerto yeah. Rico. Um, where's my other dude in, <laughs> yeah. in California? No, and but yeah, um, I don't want to keep you guys because yeah. it's like. It's and also place. look out for June, for June, for June yes. with our Women Veterans Appreciation. June 12th is Women Veterans Appreciation on day and look out for more things to come. The exhibit that we did last year will hopefully be um, put together this year. Um, so please, you know, once you hear that we are going to do the exhibit, please support us. Um, again, um, it could be a half an hour visit, it could be a 10 minute visit, but your support um, and, you know, we really appreciate anything. And just, you know, special shout outs to SOS stakeholders, um, AJ Luna, David Pearson, um, the team there for or supporting um, Claymore Vets, um, the, the MAVA, different organization, Operation Sisterhood. Um, I'll even, me, Miss Army will say Marine Corps League. <laughs> um, but, um, but other organizations that have given um, their support and their kindness um, to Claymore Vets, um, we truly, truly appreciate the... Um, the yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we the family we you, we consider you all family. So thank you so much for all the support that you've given us. But special thanks to Maria because she is the brainchild, and she created this cohesive, you know, environment that is very special, and it, it endear. It's very warming to all our hearts. And again, thank you, Maria, for allowing us to grace um, your space in the way that um, we work. Um, and I, I value our friendship, but I also value the organization and your passion behind it. So, are you guys gonna make me cry? <laughs> no, I, I love y'all. And, and I second that. I second that. And and Maria, you know, just the other night, um, the 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 fact how the small world, the, how small the world is, is uh, through my connection with Maria and Claymore Vets and her artistry, I was actually able to reconnect with my stepfather. Who I hadn't seen in 18 years um, this past Friday. And that is the uh, community of artists, along with the community of veterans, the veteran artist community together put me in that position where I was able to reconnect with that person and who was a very important part of my life growing up. So, you know, it, it's symbiotic all the way around, you know. So thank thank you for that opportunity, Maria. I really appreciate that with you too. You know how I was like, oh, my heart was so happy for you. Listen, the energy we put out is the energy that brings back to us. And I really believe in that. And that's why I am always so grateful that I have these amazing women by me. And um, yeah, Bernie, you want to give a, a closing regards before we head out? And Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all moving to North Carolina, apparently. Yes. Well, I'm going to come visit. I have to come visit. People say bad things about the South, but North, North Carolina is actually a very progressive state. Unfortunately, you have to remember the progression in the state is all in the urban areas, and but we still, excuse the expression, we still got the bubbles out in the 
out in the farmlands out there. So. <laughs> but but it's really progressive. And it's nice to live in a place where I live in the city. I live between University of North Carolina and Duke University. So so we have um, we have a lot of good things going on. The art community is big down here. Really, really big down here. So Marie, you've done an awesome job. What were you going to say? No, I was going to say there's going to be a field trip to North Carolina because we're we're planning uh, an exhibit there. Right. So, right. Jennifer, remember? In yeah. Yeah. Right. Delma, yeah. Delma, Louise, and Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> Delma, Louise, and Lucy. Yeah, remember I told you about the, the, the metal sculptor guy that was... Yeah, he's down in Fayetteville. Fayetteville right, right, right. an hour and a half from me. Yeah. 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 But so and there's, a great, and there's a great artist community in um, the Greensboro area. My... my um, my cousin Marilyn is um, an artist and she's in the Greensboro area and they have some wonderful art exhibits going on. So again, anytime you need me yes. to come to North Carolina, I'll be more than happy to go. And you know, any opportunity I can go next to a Waffle House, I'm down. That's what I'm saying. You said a biscuit, I'll be there. <laughs> That's why. That mother covered in life for me. Thank you. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I think one of the things that's so special is we are the people, we are the woman veterans that get out and do more for other veterans. Uh, there's a huge community. North Carolina has registered the VA, has 800,000 veterans registered at the VA. And wow. so, you know, there's probably more. We have a huge population of women veterans. And the good news is, you know, Maria knows me, Bernie knows everybody. And, and a lot of my friends are younger veterans, uh, OEF, OIF, uh, women veterans who share a lot of the same things that we were, that we talk about. Um, in two weeks, um, one of the organizations is having a woman veterans luncheon. And, and, so, we, and we will be very remiss to not mention that Bernie was featured in the sports veterans, you know, veterans affairs for her athletics, for what she's done in the community. Oh, wow. So I have to give props to Bernie because, again, yeah. she is a powerhouse. And, and, yeah. and again, you know, there's a lot of powerhouses here and, and Bernie is one of them. You know, she was featured in the I Am Not Invisible campaign as well. So Bernie is a, a rock star in our community. So to have yeah, she rocks that that picture. I love of her. You know, oh, she's I there know. for she's RWB badass. shirt, and she is. I'm saying, yeah. I was actually the, I was the chapter veterans engagement coordinator and and captain for the Raleigh Durham chapter. Who that's kind of falling apart these anymore, but but um, I was really active in RWB for a long time, and some other issues now. A lot of us aren't active in it, but. But it's a great organization. So, yeah. Yeah. and next week I'm doing a um, Habitat is having an all women's build. Oh, oh. Also, I, I know we talk about, I mean, this is Women's Month, so we're talking about all women, but we do yeah. serve all veterans. So, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. all y'all males, don't get your silkies in a bunch. <laughs> you guys can come hang out with us. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> anyways, I'm going to let, like, we'll let you guys go because I don't want to keep everybody like, Tight of here because we'll talk forever, but I love Orleans you. Is snoozing. Orleans is snoring at my feet, so oh, <laughs> I love you all. Thank you so much. For Thank you so much. I'll see you guys. Good night. Thanks, everybody, that Good joined night. us. Okay.